إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده هبضهما وهو العلي العظيم لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي فمن يكفر بالطاغوت ويؤمن بالله فقد استمسك بالعروة الوثقى لم فصام لها والله سميع عليم الله ولي الذين آمنوا يخرجهم من الظلمات إلى النور والذين كفروا أولياؤهم الطاغوت يخرجونهم من النور إلى الظلمات أولئك أصحاب النار هم فيها خالدون صدق الله العلي العظيم وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين الفاتحة محمد وآل محمد سلوان کیسے یہ داغ دل سے سکینہ مٹا سکے کیسے یہ داغ دل سے سکینہ مٹا سکے جا کر سوئے فرات نہ آباس آ سکے حسن ہوا پامال اس طرح سے شبیہ ہے حسن ہوا شبیہ ہے حسن ہوا ٹکڑے بھی لاش کے نا شہدی ملا سکے جا کر سوئے فرات نا آباس آ سکے کیسے یہ داغ دل سے مشکوں علم جو خون میں 
डूबे लबे फुरात मशको अलम जो खून में डूबे लबे फुरात डूबे लबे फुरात अब्बास फिर न प्यासों को सूरत दिखा सके जाकर सुए फुरात ना बास आ सके कैसे ये दाग दिल से थोड़ी कुछ और गैरते बास ने कमर तोड़ी कुछ और गैरते बास ने कमर अब्बास ने कमर लाशा नयूफ रात से सरवर उठा सके जाकर सुए फुरात ना बास आ सके कैसे ये दाग दिल से सकीना मिटा सके Membership is now due for renewal. Please inquire at either desk. Tomorrow, Tuesday, the 15th of November, ladies' program will begin at 12 noon with Zahra Namaz, Hadith Kisa, Marisha, Majlis, ending with Martim and Zyarat. And inshallah, the main program will begin at 7.45 p.m. with Maghrib Bain Namaz, Dua Tawassul, Quran, Marisha, Majlis Paseh, Jawar Kazwini, ending with Matsum and Ziyarat. On Wednesday, the 16th of November, ladies' program will also begin at 12 p.m. noon with Zahra Namaz, Hadith Kisa, Marisha, Majlis, ending with Matsum and Ziyarat. And the main program, again, will begin at 7.45 p.m. with Maghrib Bain Namaz, Quran, Marisha, Majlis Paseh, Jawar Kazwini, ending with Matsum and Ziyarat. Brothers and sisters, as you are aware, the Jamaat incurs additional costs during these holy nights, and as such, we humbly request each family to donate a minimum of £50 towards the general fund. For those who wish to recite at Haydari, please log on to our website, www.haydari.org.uk, where you can fill out the online form. Brothers and sisters, can we please recite the Washafa for Ayaz by Ramji, Tahra Bibi of Karachi, Mehdi Ali Hussein, Hassan Ali Kesfani, Zahra Jafar, who was injured in the tram accident, a four month old baby who was having major surgery on Tuesday, a brother who was critically well, and all those that are unwell or suffering tonight. Dua Shafa, please. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, Amma Yujibul, Mother Tara Ida, who Yakshi Fusu. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء 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 اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد 
Lastly, brothers and sisters, can we please have Surah Fatiha for Hur and Nisa Qasimli who passed away today and for all those Mahrumeens whose names will be appearing on the screens and for all their deceased family members. Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha. As always, thank you for listening. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Jabri da asar se chini Main sada deti rahi Tu na ya ghazi ہم کو پانی نہ ملے تیری خوشبو تو رہے تیرے بازو نہ کٹے چاہے مشکی زاچ دے یہ مگر ہو نہ سکا تیرے بازو ہے جدا مجھ پہ ہے تشنا لبی تو نہ آیا غازی کیا کہوں شیر میرے بے ردا ہم کو لیے یہ مسلمہ سارے شہر در شہر گئے خلقت کوفہ کبھی خلقت شام کبھی اور ہا ہم پہ ہسی تو نہ آیا غازی جب ردا سر سے چھنی میں صدا دیتی رہی تو نہ آیا غازی صلی اللہ علیہ محمد و آل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المعصومين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة روحي وأرواح العالمين لك الفداء وأقل الفداء يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما بر محمد وآل محمد صلوات بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله 
الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله على منة الولاية وكفى بها منة وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا النبي المؤيد والرسول المسدد والمصطفى الأمجد والمحمود الأحمد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين سفن النجاة الأعلام من ركب سفينتهم نجا ومن تخلف عنها هلك وغرق ثم أما بعد Respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Philosophy of intidhar and the signs of the return of Imam al-Hujjat ibn al-Hassan, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh. <clears throat> How do we prepare ourselves and our community for the return of such an important event in the service of one of the greatest human beings of his time, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. <clears throat> it seems when we talk about these issues or when we talk about the Imam himself, there is somehow a misunderstanding in regard to the concept of awaiting, or to be considered an awaiter. What does awaiting entails, and what does it mean to be an awaiter? Someone who's awaiting the return of the Imam, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. Firstly, there are two conditions in regard to this issue. Firstly, the person is not satisfied with the present circumstances, that's why he's waiting, right? Otherwise, what is he waiting for? Or what is she waiting for? There is something that is bothering us. There is something that we are not happy with. There is something that is going wrong in this world that purports the fact that we are waiting for something to come and we're not satisfied. Needs, uh, change need to come. Change need to happen. Change need to occur in order that this satisfaction takes place. And that is what is actually highlighted in the sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The many numerous sayings by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whether it is on the part of our school of thought or in the part of the school of thoughts of our brothers in, the, in, in faith, in regard to the return of Imam Al-Mahdi Ajallallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Al-Sharif. Just in passing, by the way, the riwayat that have been mentioned in regard to the Imam Salawatullah Salaamu Alayh, they have been mentioned in more than 147 different sources from our Sunni brothers' site. In regard to Imam Al Mahdi, Ajalallah Ta'ala, Farajahu Al Sharif. So the actual case in regard to Imam Al Mahdi is not something exclusive to our school of thought. It is an Islamic issue before it is a sectarian issue. All right? Or an issue that belongs to a mazhab, a school of thought. It is an Islamic injunction, a Quranic promise, not only to Muslims even. It is to the entire world. And that's what the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wallah, the Prophet says, In law lam yabqa fi hadhi dunya illa yawman wahida. This riwayah is from our Sunni sources. The Prophet ﷺ says, By God, if there was to remain one day in this world, Allah shall extend that day until a person from my family, his name is my name, and his nickname is my nickname. يَمْلَأُ الْأَرْضِ قِسْطًا وَعَدْلَا كَمَا مُلِئَ الظُّلْمًا وَجَوْرًا He will fill this earth with justice and equity, in as much as it has been filled with injustice and iniquity. Now the question is, for those who are looking for apparent outside signs, this is the first sign you should look for. You need to see, has this world come to a stage 
where it is filled with injustice and inequity? No, it hasn't. Because there is still justice. And there is still quality or equality, right? It is not a case where there is no more justice and no more equality. In many parts of the world, justice still exists. Quality, equality still exists. So the first sign we need to look for, for the return of the imam, is not eclipse of the moons and uh, look for the eclipse of the moon in yourself first. Right? How eclipsed is the moon in yourself? Meaning, how much have you lacked or I have lacked in my interaction with others on the basis of the teachings of the Quran and Ahlul Bayt, salawatullahi wa That is the worst eclipse in our existence, right? It is unfortunate, I remember, by the way, and this is what made this place very, very much fascinating, Haidari. In 2007, when I came here, there was actually for the first time an eclipse of the moon twice in one month. Now, I remember some of the youngsters came to me and says, we're leaving back to Kufa. I said, excuse me? He said, yeah, we were going to sell our homes, divorce our wives, and go to Kufa, wait for the imam. Why, Habibi? What happened? Did you get a written message, a written invitation? He said, no, no, no. The two eclipses has taken place. I said, two eclipses have been happening since the first occultation of the imam right you should not look for signs in the outside world for return of the imam you should look for internal sides of preparedness and readiness for the return of the imam are you ready you know when you look at the concept of the return of the imam there is one concept that is often highlighted and that is the presence of 313 Right? 313 men, but the Riwaya also says, which men don't want to mention, 57 women. So there is 313 men who are in the government of the Imam, salawat Allah wa salam I remember once a Sunni Imam was giving a lecture about Imam al-Mahdi, ajjal Allah ta'ala farajah sharif He was the mufti of Australia, very prominent Sunni scholar from the graduates of Al-Azhar University. He said in his speech, he said, in my belief, the lowest rank of the 313 in the government of Imam Ali has the lofty status of being a saint, wali. He said, that's the lowest rank. Can you imagine what's the highest rank? I say to myself, then with these 313 being in the government of Imam Al-Mahdi, Sharif, out of 1.7 billion Muslims, we are unable to secure 313. And then we say, why the Imam does not come? If, one, if, if, a, if a nation has the population of 1.7 billion, cannot produce 313 credible personalities to run the government of the imam then wait and keep waiting and keep waiting because we are an ummah or a nation that is in deep sleep we are an ummah who is complacent that has not yet taken its role in the way that the imam expects of it to be and you will see soon that it is not my words what I'm saying. These are the words of the Imam himself. Salawatullah wa salamu alayh. First part of awaiting entails what? Entails the fact that we are not happy with our state of affairs. Secondly, he or she expects the improvement in such circumstances. If either of these conditions are not fulfilled, then the person concerned is not an awaiter. Awaiting here in regard to the Imam Sahibul Asri was Zaman Ajalullah Ta'ala Farajaw Sharif. <coughs> purports that an awaiter is not satisfied with the present circumstances and is hoping 
for a brighter and better future. In such circumstances, a genuine awaiter should have one very important quality, and that is he cannot or she cannot sit idle. For example, when the committee wanted to invite a speaker, what preparation takes place to invite a speaker? Do you think that sitting there and having wishful thinking for a speaker to come to Haideri will happen? No. Emails have to be sent. Negotiation about so many things, transport or accommodation or God knows what or food, if someone is as difficult as me or God knows what, right? When it comes to dietary intakes, a thousand and one thing needs to be taken into consideration. While we are saying that in the process of the arrival and all this taking place, we are actually in a state of what? Intizar for his arrival. Right? And this is a simple, ordinary, humble servant who is a human being like you and him. He is no different to you at all. He's a human being like you. Can you imagine what sort of awaiting we should display for the return of the imam then? You know, we expect to sit here and you know, some people actually perceive that we should not do anything until the imam comes. He's going to change. He's going to do, he will purport, he will advance, he, 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 while we are sitting, sipping tea, having shisha, and he will change everything. And we are what? We are the followers of the imam. You know, we are the ones who will support him. We are the ones who will defend him. You know, there are riwayat that says, that among the ones that will object to the imam that comes, not you and me, the ordinary masses, mushtahids will stand in his face. Mushtahids, people with the rank of ishtihad, they will come and say what? You know what they will say? They will say the things that this man is bringing are not familiar to us. That tells you what? That tells you how much innovations we introduced in this religion. Right? We have introduced so many innovations that when the Imam comes and wants to bring us back to the principles, to the usul, to the foundation of this faith, we find it very strange. What is this guy doing? Ah, he's fighting against the Sha'air. Really? No, 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 no. He's bringing you back to reality, he's bringing you back to the purity of that religion and what has been exercise and what has been taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Ahlul Bayt. So you find it strange. Why? Because you collide with him. What you and I have inherited will collide with what the Imam will bring to us. So we find it strange. We have to fight against him. He's an imposter. Some mushtahid call the Imam an imposter. Well, iyadu billah. Because it collides with what they have been teaching people to do and follow. It's contrary to the teachings and to the purity of the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. Look at the Quran when it talks about awaiting, for example. So we have a better understanding of what constitutes awaiting. Allah says, and say to those who do not believe that you act. He did say that you sit or you act. An unbeliever, does he sit? Or does he actively act on his disbelief? He is acting. You know, it's funny sometimes our boys come and ask questions. Of course, I'm not against questions. I'm not against inquiries. I'm not against probing into our religion to understand it. But it is funny that you have concern for someone that he himself has no concern for. What am I talking about? Some of our boys said, is an atheist going to Jannah? Habibi, he doesn't want to go. Why are you worried? Haji, well, so and so, he does not want to go. He himself telling you, I don't believe. And we are worried day and night if he's going to go. Yeah, he worry about yourself. Right? Worry whether you're going to end up there. Don't sit idle, act. Right? Act. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. And say to those, who do not believe that you act 
as much as you can. Look what Allah says. And we are also acting and trying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he describes himself, what does he say in Surah Al-Rahman? كُلَّ يَوْمٍ هُوَ فِي شَانٍ Right? كُلَّ يَوْمٍ هُوَ فِي شَانٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not idle. Right? Like we sit sometimes idle on ends and do nothing. And then you know what? One of the strangest thing about us Muslims, including me, is what we call the quality of selective hearing. You know? Three days I'm talking about marriage. We only hear what suits us in what the rights and obligation are between husband and wife. Ah, did you hear what the sheikh said? We go to the wife about his rights. But we don't hear what the sheikh said about also the rights of the woman towards the man. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-rijalu qawamuna ala nisa Men are the maintainers and the protectors of who? Of women. By virtue of what? What gave them that authority to be maintainers of women? What? The fact that they spend on the household, right? So if a man sits 24 hours on his bed or on his couch, flipping sky channels day and night, and expects his children or his wife to spend on him, is he any longer fitting to be described as a maintainer? Don't ask for your right, man. Right? Give the rights first. Then come and ask for your rights. Islam is not to be taken for a joke, brothers and sisters. Because it's not a joke. Islam is an organized religion with set of laws that Allah expects you to respect them. Whatever is yours, expect to take. But whatever it's others, expect to what? Give. Right? You cannot be a just human being, which is one of the most important qualities in a person, is to be just. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ Bring within your setup the attributes of Allah. What is the most important attribute of Allah after unicity? Oneness, Tawheed. That He is what? Adil. Adil. He is just. No one in his government, no one under his control is ever dealt with on the basis of dhulm. He himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala, says what? He says, إِنِّي حَرَّمْتُ الظُّلْمَ عَلَى نَفْسِي وَجَعَلْتَهُ بَيْنَ الْعِبَادِ مُحَرَّمًا فَلَا تَظَالَمُوا Allah says in a Qudsi hadith, I have made dhulm haram on me. And no one can force Allah to make things haram on him, Right? He, by his own infinite ability and wisdom, dictates the terms of what he wants to do and not to do. No one can dictate terms on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He makes these terms. He says, I have made on myself dhulam haram. So do not act among yourselves in a way that constitutes dhulam. It's not befitting. And you know what? One of the most important things about adil and not to commit zulm, oppression towards others, is what? Is that the zulm between people, oppression, is not forgiven by Allah. Allah does not interfere. Allah interferes in regard to the question of forgiveness when it comes to you and Him. You are negligent in certain prayers. He'll turn a blind eye. He'll forgive you for it. Negligent in terms of some siyam. He'll forgive you for it. Negligent in terms of some, you know, financial responsibilities such as khums and zakat. He will forgive you for it. Anything between you and Allah is subject to what? Forgiveness. If you ask Allah for forgiveness. Nothing between you and another human being is subject to forgiveness when it comes to Allah. Why? Because he says, this is not my haq. This is his or her haq. Right? Justice. You want to ask forgiveness for the haq of another human being? Don't come to me. Go to him. Right? You have taken his haq. You have taken her haq. Don't come to me. Don't come and say, Ya Allah, I gossiped about this person. Or I slandered against this person. Ya Allah, with your infinite wisdom, forgive my sins for gossip. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ridicules that particular prayer. He says, what sort of a prayer is this which is not befitting? If you really have done something wrong towards another human being or taken his haq away or right, go to that human being and solicit an apology and forgiveness from that person. Now, the question that follows is that how about if I do, right? And that person says, I'm not forgiving you. Because you get that sort of people, right? You get that sort of... And you know what? The concept of forgiveness and forgetfulness or the question of forgetting and forgiving should also be governed by another dimension. What is that dimension? That it should not be recurrent, you know? Today I spoke about you badly. I came, I apologize. Tomorrow you speak the same thing. What sort of forgiveness is this? How do you want me to forgive this? How do you expect me to forget this? How do you expect me to, to, to forgive this? If it's going to be recurrent on a daily basis or weekly basis or monthly basis, it doesn't work, right? It means there is a pre, you know, meditated intention to continue to do what? The harm. To continue the harm. When someone commits a murder, in a legal terminology, what do they call it? Why do they call a murder a murder, not manslaughter in law? Who knows? Thank you so much. One is premeditated and one is not. One is by mistake. One is by intention. It's premeditated. That's why the level of punishment for premeditated murder is higher than man slaughter. Let's use that example. If you spoke something bad about someone and you apologize and you didn't go back to it, maybe that's manslaughter. Right? But on a continuous basis, I want to scathe and tarnish your character and then come and that's a joke. It becomes what? It becomes a joke. You know, one of the conditions of tawbah, according to Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi, is what? Is that, he says, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, there are three conditions for tawbah. One of them is what? Is not to go back to it. You know, when you want to ask for tawbah, for repentance from Allah, you must commit yourself not to do what? Not to go back to it. Not to go back to the same act. You may fall in another act. Okay. I'm not saying, okay, yani, yes, do it. I'm saying, yani, in, in speaking terminology. You may fall into the trap of being lured into another act of infringement. But that should not lead you back to the same act of infringement. Or to the same sin or harmful act that you've done in the first place that you are asking Allah for forgiveness towards. No, it doesn't work like this. Imam Ali says you must pull out of that situation. Change your thinking methodology and, you know, pattern of thinking about this particular act. Don't fall into it again. So when we listen, including myself, about a lecture, let's be comprehensive about what we are listening let us go home and sit with our wives, with our parents, with our children and say, you know what? Today we learned something new about marital relationship between husband and wife. Where have we gone wrong as husbands and wife? And let's fix it on both ends. Not just go and say, ah, you heard? Yeah, I heard. But did you hear? Did you hear yourself as well? No, he, he, she doesn't want to hear. He doesn't want to hear. Everyone wants to pull towards his own, you know, interest in the matter. That's not justice. Look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about awaiting. And say to those who do not believe that you act as much as you can. We are also trying and acting. You all await and surely we are also awaiting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. So here, this is an open challenge to us all that we all must make our best efforts during this crucial time. The question is, in light of this challenge, can anyone then claim or say that awaiting implies sitting idle and remaining oblivious to what is happening around us? Or what is happening within us? 
You know, I often ask myself this question. You and I, all right, according to the number of years we've lived, right? You've lived 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 80s, whatever it is. Start thinking along those lines. When did you first attend the first majlis for Imam Hussein? Let's say at the age of 15. So we can start with accountability, right? I don't want to start with not being accountable. 15 years old, now you are 50. How many years? 35 years, right? Imagine if in 35 years, each year, you advanced yourself on the teachings of Imam Hussein 5%. Each year. 35 years times 5%, you should be now a saint. Right? But Muharram comes, and Muharram goes, and Ramadan comes, and Ramadan goes, and we're still sitting idle. Nothing has changed in 35 years of ourselves. Yes, you may started to pray. Well done, mate. Yeah? Yes, you started to fast. Good on you. Yes. Uh, but when it comes to real application of the akhlaq and the principles of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi, we find ourselves are very confused about our identity from one Muharram to another, from one Ramadan to another. When Muharram comes, all the black comes out. Ramadan comes, all the white comes out. Muharram goes, all the, all the, 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 the black goes into the cupboard. Ramadan goes, all the white goes in the cupboard. In between, I don't know, we are rainbow. I don't know what we are. Huh? Multicolored, multi-identity, confused. And then we are still awaiting for the imam to the come. You know, this is passing, passing the buck mentality. We are confused. Yeah, imam, you come and fix it up. Just like those, you know, the imam prays in Karbala. The imam prays in Karbala. Two of his companions die in the process of protecting the medium of salah. And some people in Matam, when salah comes, they refuse to pray. I don't understand this mentality. Wallah al -azim, I don't understand someone who comes to do as a diary for Imam Hussein and neglects his prayer. Under what paradigm this person operates or under what paradigm this person thinks that he is attaching himself to Imam Hussein, I fail to understand the logic. Do you think, you know, I ask someone once, what is the mission of Imam Hussein in Karbala? What was it for? What was he protecting? He says he's protecting the tenets of Islam. Right? He did not come out for power. You know, when this was his name came and he was asked, you know, that Zakir Naik, Dr. Zakir Naik, okay? When he was asked openly in a forum of Thousands upon thousands of people. What was the conflict between Yazid and Imam Hussein? He said it was over political aspiration or political gains. You think Imam Hussein is worried about this triviality of this world? You think Imam Hussein is concerned about this passing transient world that means nothing to Imam Hussein sallallahu alaihi That his main concern, as he has established it himself, ma kharashtu ashiran wala batara wala zaliman wala mufsida. Right? I did not come out of arrogance. I did not come out of haughtiness, seeking the leisures of this world. I did not come out an oppressing person. I did not come as a corrupt human being. Then why did you come out, Ya Ibn Rasulullah? I came out seeking reform. Reform. What reform? Reform in the fact that the tenets of Quran and the tenets of Islam and the teaching of Rasulullah has been watered down to such an extent that it has become a joke. That yes, Yazid prayed, right? But what sort of prayer? Hmm? What sort of prayer was it? Right? The prayer that he doesn't know whether he prayed two or four rak'at. Huh? The prayer that does not prevent him and stops him from acting in a way that is unjust. Then this is not prayer. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when he describes prayer what? إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا 
عن الفحشاء والمنكر surely prayer stops evil and corruption then if evil and corruption are not stopped on the basis of prayer then this prayer has what has a defect in it right there is a problem in this prayer that needs to be rectified and brought back to the way it was observed by rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam that's why he came out he came out to preserve these teachings kharajtu li talab al islah i came out seeking reform to remind us then when anything goes wrong it is our duty on the basis of our individual capacity and in our capacity as part of a community to begin the process of reform within ourselves and within the community that we live in otherwise can we call ourselves husseinis hmm? can we call ourselves the followers of imam hussein you know sometimes you can call yourself the lover of imam hussein there's a huge difference between being a lover of imam hussein and a follower of imam hussein because one's entails lip service and one entails action right you can say i love someone from now till the day of judgment right you can tell your wife i love you i adore you you are the apple of my eyes you are the moon that shines in my dark night what a lot of nonsense you know you are this you are this you are that not once in your life you took her out to dinner are you talking about love what love is this this is lip service you know i told one of our community members in dar es salam once you know from the member i said imam sadiq sallallahu alaihi wa says in one of his hadith sallu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad he says one statement one phrase you say to your wife she will never forget it for the rest of her life imam sadiq saying this i love you imam says go tell your wives this member of our community in dar es salaam comes to me he grabs me from here he says sheikh come come i have something i want to tell you he says now at 65 with this white hair in my bead you want me to go home and tell my wife i love you i said try it try it what are you gonna lose he says there's something wrong with you guys you these all young speakers coming out these days from hausa you know things we've never heard before where do you get these teachings from i say yeah me try it wallah without a word of a lie next day he comes with a smile from one end to the other he says may allah bless your soul and bless your parents this is the best da'wah you can get you know when someone send blessing on your parents not on you you're nothing your parents made you you know if you reach a position of fame and a position of respect in this world always attribute it first to allah and then to your parents because they are the ones that made you they are the ones that spent everything for what you are now and at their own cost wallah at their own you know health at their own rest so that you be in a position you are in anyway I said, thank you, uncle. What happened? He said, yesterday, I told my wife, I love you. I got the best massage in 65 years. <laughs> Subhanallah. Imagine if you've done it 65 years ago. <laughs> or 30 years when you first got married. You know, our problem is that we are too feisty, too angry. You know, we don't know how to be relaxed. It's like one of the signs of a mu'min is to frown. Hajib. Wallah, one of the signs of a mu'min is to smile, right? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says what? Says smiling in the face of your brother is an act of charity. Allahu Akbar. Charity! And you know what? It's the cheapest charity you can give. To the extent that everyone can afford it. The one that have and the one that doesn't have. You don't need money to smile. If you are rich, if you are poor, if you are destitute, if you are homeless, you can still what? Smile. And in order also to help you smile, Allah help you on a physical basis. It takes less muscles to smile than to frown. Scientifically proven. You know? It takes less muscles, you know, facial expressions. It is difficult to frown. It requires so much muscles that's why we are depressed that's why we are oppressed 
That's why we are under so much pressures because we make issues out of non-issues. Right? Go home, reconcile your differences. What is this life? Make life. You know what our motto should be in life is this. Make life simple. Stop making life difficult for yourself and for those that you love. Those that you brought into this world. Those that you have a relationship with. Don't make it difficult. And you know what? Most situations, most situations, what do we fight over? What do we fight over? Either money, finances, or ego. Or both are condemned. Both are condemned in the Quran and on the teachings and the lips of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, uh, Ahlul Bayt. Rasulullah says, Hubbu dunya ra'su kulli khati'a. The love of this world is the epitome of every sin. Right? Loving this world at the cost of your own beloved ones. The ones that you have a relationship, you prefer money over making your family happy. Hajib. This human being really strange. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him in the Quran in these superlatives. That a human being, when he loses track of his real identity and the purpose behind his creation, he becomes to act in a way that reduces his humanity to a level where he becomes lower than some of the worst creatures that crawl on the face of this earth. Yet, by the same token, if he elevates his spirituality and makes himself... You know, aloof from the love of this world, he reaches a higher status that takes him above the malaika. Right? Above the angels. How beautiful it is to reach that lofty status. That lofty status of being higher than the malaika cannot be achieved while sitting down and being oblivious. Awaiting, brothers and sisters, means to remain always alert and defeat our own weaknesses at every front. You want the imam to come? Start with defeating your own weaknesses. With our own weaknesses. Look introspectively and see what is going wrong internally within myself. Imam al-Kadim, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. has a statement which is similar to many of our imams, but in particular this statement by the imam. He says what? لَيْسَ مِنَّا أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ لَمْ يُحَاسِبْ نَفْسَهُ فِي كُلِّ لَيْلَةِ Imam al-Kadim says he is not among us, the family of the Prophet. You know how we love to be among the family of the Prophets, to, uh, to be considered among their followers? Imam al-Kadim negates that. He says, you cannot be among us, أَهْلُ الْبَيْتِ if you do not bring yourself to account on a daily basis. Every day you must sit with yourself for five minutes and say, where did I go wrong? You know, if you have a shop, if you have a business, don't you run through your accounts on a daily basis? Why? Are your accounts business-wise more important to you and me than the accounts of my akhirah? Allahu Akbar. This is akhirah, eternal. This dunya is what? perishing it's not gonna last if this dunya was to last then who would be more worthy of it than the entire human race it would be muhammad wa al muhammad right salawatullah wa salamu alayhim ajma'in yet we find muhammad and al muhammad they were killed they were persecuted they were martyred why because this dunya is not worth it right it is the akhirah that we should be concerned with. We make and make and make and make and we accrue wealth upon wealth. Then what? You know, then what? This thing that we inherited sometimes from our forefathers for a rainy day. When is this rainy day going to come? You know, when? You already have 17 million in the bank account. You're still waiting for a rainy day. And if that rainy day comes, how many millions you want to, you know, fix that rainy day? That you keep putting in your bank account more and more and more. And then you know, Allahumma at'am kulla ja'ah. Allahumma at'am kulla ja'ah. You have 17 million dollars in your bank account. What ja'ah are you talking about? You know, start with yourself. Put that effort. But you know what the problem is with those who have? Is that they have the hand over money. But they don't have the heart to release it. You know? And that's the problem with the heart. When it becomes blackened with the love of dunya, it cannot see anything beyond dunya. 
It can only concentrate on the dunya, you know? Go out. The merit and the beauty of, of giving, in the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is more worthy than that that receives. Look across the board. Look across the world. Look at across all celebrations and awards in the world. Have you ever seen one award given to someone that receives? Or is it given to someone that what? Gives. Not one award is given for someone that what? Receives. It's always in recognition of those who give. Subhanallah. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, he says, the hand that gives is better than the hand that what? Receives. Subhanallah. And he said, in both there is goodness. Because there are believers in Allah. But still, the one that gives is higher with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the hand that takes. I think we all should agree that awaiting necessitates a rational human being to evolve and develop in order to achieve perfection through a constant motion of endeavors and trials until the fulfillment of that objective. Look at Imam al-Baqir, what he says in that regard. <clears throat> He says, if you act on our advice and teachings and remain in the same condition, then whoever dies before the advent of the imam will attain the lofty status of martyrs. Allahu Akbar. If you are continuously engaging on the teachings of Ahlul Bayt and you die and you don't have the opportunity to be with the imam, Allah will give you the reward of what? Of a martyr. Then he says, in another tradition by Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, the one who desires to be among the companions of Al-Qa'im, Allah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif, what should he do? Look at the first quality that the Imam mentioned. He says, then he must, he must wait. But in the process of waiting, what does he do? This is the best description of waiting. From the lips of an imam, salawat alayhi wa sallam He says, yes, you should wait. But as we said already, that waiting does not mean what? Sitting idle, right? It means a constant motion of change and endeavors to what? To attain the objective or the goal that you are working for. He said, then you must wait. Adopt piety and behave courteously. Subhanallah. Adopt piety and behave courteously. These two statements encompass all the teachings of Islam in two words. Subhanallah. Because when you gain piety, piety does what to you? Taqwa. What is taqwa? Literally, brothers and sisters, the interpretation or the definition of taqwa in Arabic is to keep away. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, What? Ya ayyuhalladina amanu taqullah. Literally, it means, Oh, you believe, keep away from Allah. That's the literal meaning. But there is a hidden verb in this ayah. What is that hidden verb? Allah is saying, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, keep away from what keeps you from Allah. <laughs> Subhanallah. That's the meaning. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, keep away from what keeps you from Allah. So it is all the teachings of Islam. You know? And behave courteously. Be like your Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. That he says about himself, Addabani rabbi fa ahsana ta'adibi. It is God who morally trained me and he perfected his training of me. Subhanallah. What an amazing human being Rasulullah was in terms of his character, in terms of the way he dealt with people, in terms of the way he gave respect to others, in, in the way he accommodated others. You know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day comes to the mosque and he doesn't find a place to sit. This is another big problem with our Muslim community. You know, I don't find a place to sit because I have a amama on my head. What do I expect? Every Tom, Dick and Harry to stand for me. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? That if people want to show that respect, fine. But to expect it, that's ego. That's ego. That is zulam for your community. Zulam. 
for your community. To expect respect without earning that respect. Just because, you know, it's a tradition, you know. A alim comes, oh, yalla, get up. No, get up for what? What knowledge does he have? What has he contributed to the community? And what gives him that, yes, that respect should be given if that alim is serving. Right? He's putting himself out there for the community to reach out to him. But some alims, you don't even know where they live. You need three months appointment to see them. Ajib. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. House address was known to friend and foe. Amir al muminin house was accessed by everyone. Ahlul Bayt houses were in reach of the community that their followers would come and knock on their doors without a hajib. You know what a hajib is? A barrier or a guard that stands in front of the door that does not allow people to enter except with the permission of the owner of the house. No. People used to come to the house of the Prophet, Surah Hujurat, so that you say, where do I get these teachings from? I don't pull things from a hat. Right? I'm saying from our heritage, from the Quran, the best heritage we have in our hands. So authentic that cannot be defied. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what in Surah Al-Hujurat? He says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُوَا إِنَّ الَّذِينَ uh, يُخَاطِبُونَكَ No, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ Surah Al-Hujurat إِنَّ الَّذِينَ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ مَصَلَّ عَلَى مُحَمَّدْ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدْ I'll give the English translation until the Arabic comes. Those who call for you from behind the chambers to come out to them, right? Means what? Means people used to come, stand in front of the houses of the Prophet because the house of the Prophet was made of rooms. One room for each wife, right? And each of these rooms overlooks what? The mosque. So the Prophet, if he entered one of his wife's, for example, chambers, when the time for Salah comes or when there is something urgent, straight away from the house of his wives, he enters what? The mosque, right? Those who call you from behind the chambers, majority of them, they don't think properly. They are insane. Why? Because they are not doing it courteously. What do they do? They used to come and stand in front. But the idea is what? Is that they used to come and stand in front of the Prophet's house and call him, Ya Muhammad, Ukhruj ilayna. Oh Muhammad, come out to what? To us. We have something with you. But you know why Allah objected to this act? In normal circumstances, Allah would not have objected. But the reason why Allah objected is they would wait for the time of lunch or the time that the Prophet would take rest. You know? And this is teaching what? Adab. Adab. Sometimes when you want to go to someone's house, choose a right time. Right? Don't just go. You know, I want to go and visit someone. You know, don't, today we have so many means of communication that no matter where this person, you can reach him. Twitter, Facebook, emails, text message, Viber, WhatsApp, you name it, you have it. Right? So call, text, say, look, I want to come. Is it possible for me to come and see you? Are you at a good time for me to come and see you? Yeah, come. But these people, okay, they didn't have telephones. They didn't, but they have the mosque as a meeting place. You want something with the Prophet? Talk to him. Tell him, when can I see you? Don't just show up because it's the time of lunch. And Allah continues. He says, you know what? Because, he says, don't wait for smoke to be seen from the Prophet's house. Because smoke means what? Something being cooked. Because when you do wait for that, and then you go towards the Prophet and knock on his door, the Prophet will be too modest and shy not to invite you in. But look what Allah says. Wallahu la yastahi min al haqq. But Allah is, will not shy away from telling you that this is a wrong act. You know? Because that is disturbing the Prophet. But he was reachable. Reachable. Ahlul Bayt were reachable. Imam al Hussein, salawat alayhi wa sallam, alayhi, someone comes to his door, knocks on his door, he says, Yeah, Imam, I had fallen under debt. Yes, how much is your debt? 40,000 dinars. 
40,000 dinars. Imagine going to someone from our, alhamdulillah, well-off people, and you tell him, you know, not 40,000, 40 dollars. 400 pounds, okay, of fallen debt. 4,000 pounds, not 40,000. He says, 40,000. Imam Hussein says, Kambar, what do we have from the kharaj of Hijaz? What do we have from the money that comes to us from Hijaz? He said, 20,000, Ya Ibn Rasulullah. He said, bring it. Bring it. He brings it, puts it in an, you know, a cloth, and then the Imam goes out, opens the door halfway, puts his hand out, and gives it to the man. Initially, when the man knocked on the Imam's house, the Imam opened the whole door. This time, the Imam closed the door halfway and gave the money behind the door. And he said, go to our neighbor, so-and-so, with this letter, and tell him, my Imam sent me to you. So the man started crying. Started crying. He opened the envelope or the cloth. He found 20,000. And then he found in the letter that he was sending to the man that this is from your Imam Hussein to the neighbor, to our neighbor. Fulfill the need of your brother. With the next what? 20,000, right? And then he says to the man, when he starts crying, why are you crying? He hears him crying. He says, why are you crying? Have we been negligent towards you? Are we negligent that we did not satisfy you with the whole debt? He says, no, that's not the cause of my crying. But the cause of my crying is I cannot fathom how the sand will eat your body on the plains of Karp. How, that, how this sand will come on your body on the sand of Karbala, how this sand will be covering your body and that generosity of yours, Ya Ibn Amir al-Mu'mineen. Now he goes, Kambar comes. He says, Ya Ibn Rasulillah, why did you open the, first, the, uh, the, the door in the first occasion and you close the door in the second occasion? He said, because when I opened the door the first time and he began to ask for the loan, I could see the humility in his face. Imagine if I opened the door when I gave him the money, how humiliated he will feel. I did not want to cause more humility to my brother. This is akhlaq. This is akhlaq. This is morality. Now we give someone a thousand dollars, we will not hear the end of it until I'm in my grave. Remember the thousand dollars I give? Oh, come and take it, ya akhi. Release me from that ransom. You know, wallah, I'll sell my furniture, but stop telling me. Remember the 1,000 I gave you. For how long are you going to keep telling me this? Right? Just forget it. You know, don't, you know, always piety and behave courteously. If you die in that process, if you die in that process, what happens? Look what the Imam says. If you die in such a condition before the coming of the Mahdi or the Imam, then his reward will be similar to the one that is in the era of Al Imam Al Mahdi and supporting him. Allahu. It's like now you are with who? With the Imam, even if he's not with you. If you remain within the boundaries of what? Piety and courtesy. Hence, the Imam says, he continues, he says, Hence, what should you do? He said, Strive vigorously, await his arrival. Congratulations to you all for your relentless awaiting. Relentless awaiting means don't sit idle. When you are waiting, be active. Change yourself. Develop yourself. Make yourself progress spiritually, financially, mentally, intellectually, communally. Right? Don't be stagnant. You know, someone asked someone, how's your day today? He said, it's horizontal. Uh, Nothing, no ups, no downs. Flat. You know? And sometimes you ask me, or we ask ourselves, how is our iman? Horizontal. No? He says horizontal. Nothing shakes it. Nothing changes it. Nothing develops it. Nothing, you know, elevates it. Because we are not striving vigorously to change ourselves as the Imam Salawatullah wa salamu alayhi says. He says, while the first tradition calls for complete emulation of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi, the first hadith by Imam al-Baqir, the second hadith by Imam al-Sadiq, which I just read, so that human thinking and belief may always stay alert and aware 
of their responsibilities in the world. How? By exerting the human race to adopt piety and rationality of action so that both in action and in theory, there should be no discrepancy. It's not just good standing here for an hour talking about Islam. That's called what? Theory. Right? That theory should not negate or be in any way contradictory to the time when I what? Leave the door of the Husseiniya. No. In theory and in action, there should be what? One and the same. We should marry the two concepts together. That when I speak and take pride in Islam, that pride I take in Islam should be put into what? Into action. Into practice. And then I will be what? A person that is following and emulating Ahlul Bayt. While the other tradition further clarifies that awaiting does not mean remaining idle and careless. It never purports me verbal claim without practice, but it signifies endless efforts and earnest endeavors, as the Imam himself says, Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, then all of you must do such deeds which draw you nearer to our love and affection, and refrain from such act which evokes our anger and displeasure. Therefore, a true awaiter is the one that always seeks to please the Imam of his time. His or her every effort is directed at achieving the invaluable pleasure of the Imam, and it is but evident that the pleasure of the Imam is what? Is in abiding by the tenets of Islam and not in its sacrilege and wastage. Right? What do you think pleases the Imam today? If the Imam was to appear, or if the Imam, we know he's among us. If the Imam now walks into our Husaydiyah, or the Imam walks among us in public, what do you think will make the Imam happy? That we don't pay enough due right for our salah, for our akhlaq, for our trustworthiness, for our, you know, amana, for the way we behave in public, for the respect we should have for our parents, for the rahmah we should have for our children, for the respect and the mutual respect between husband and wife. If the imam was to come into our community and finds none of this, you think the imam will be happy? The imam will say, you are my followers? No. The imam will be happy if he comes into a community or he comes into our Muslim setup and finds, you know, mashallah, we are united. We are brothers and sisters. We give when there is a need without even having to let that person come and ask for the need. Right? We go to them before they come to ask. Right? We are consolidated. We strengthen the presence of one another. If someone is weak, we elevate him. If someone is helpless, we help him. If someone is unemployed, we give him what? Employment. That is Islam. Islam is not prayer. You know? But unfortunately, one of our youth once asked me, why are Jews and Christians always successful and we are not? I said, simple. I drew two circles, three circles. In the first circle, I had two Jews. They were already out. You know, the circle is a hole, like a well. They're already out. The second circle or hole, there's one Christian who's already out and he's reaching out to his brother to pull him out. But in the third one that represents the Muslims, one is trying to get out, the other is trying to pull him down. That's how we are. We cannot see someone doing well. Either we make stories about him or her. How? From where? What did he do? Ah, he must have dealt with haram first. Ajeeb. Ya Allah. Ya Allah. You put it on yourself to make such a grave accusation against your brother on the basis of he say, he say, you know, you haven't seen. Someone must have told you, you know, or you thought, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, doubt does not take the place of certitude. Right? Doubt cannot be replaced with what? With certitude. Unless you are certain, don't. And even if you are certain, also don't. Don't mean, means what in the second situation? Don't go and say it. Imam Ali says in one of his ahadith in Nahjul Balagh, salawatullah wa salamu Ali. 
He says, by God, if I see two people committing an act of sin in, the, in broad daylight. Yani where? In public or private? Public, right? By the grace of Allah, I will take my abaa off and cover them. So that I would not expose them. So that I could cover their sin. Per chance they will come back to Allah. In our case, what do we do? No, we go to the London Tribute. You know? We'll write an article. This guy did this. We destroy him, the family, the community, the rest of the setup. You know? And, fi and finally, we find out that in the end, it was what? An accusation. Has no basis for it whatsoever. And then we beat our chest. Hussein, 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 Hussein. Hussein wants this. Ali al Akbar wants this. Al Qasim wants this. The Ashab of Imam Hussein wants this. Rasulullah wants this. Ali ibn Abi Talib wants this. Ali ibn Abi Talib had enemies or not? Had those who didn't like him or not? How did he deal with them? Imam Ali would be giving his speech in what? Masjid al-Kufa. In the member of Masjid al-Kufa. There was another person that for personal reasons, he didn't like Amir al-Mu'mineen. He didn't like him. You know? Call him munafir, call him whatever you want. Right? Rasulullah says, لا يحبك إلا مؤمن ولا يبغضك إلا منافق. Right? Oh Ali, no one loves you but a mu'min and no one hates you but a... Call him whatever you want. But look how Imam Ali dealt with him. That person called Muhammad ibn al-Ash'ath. Uh, sorry, al-Ash'ath ibn Qais. His name is al-Ash'ath ibn Qais. What did, what did he used to do? Amir al-Mu'mineen is giving his Friday prayer on the member. He would bring his own member and he will sit outside Masjid Kufa and he will start to speak badly about Amir al-Mu'mineen. Simultaneously, at the same time, in the middle of the road, in front of everyone. So the people, the Askar, they call them, you know, the army, you know, those who used to organize traffic and what have you, and uh, they would come to Amir Moses, yeah, Amir Mu'mineen, should we do, should, you know, those sidekicks, should we fix him up for you? You know, yeah, akhi, you know, those, they, what do you call them in your community, chamchas? La hawla wa la you know, those chamchas, you know, sit outside and all they do is just to monitor people, you know? I don't, alhamdulillah, you don't have anyone in this community. But each community has it, by the way. Don't worry. Don't feel bad. <laughs> each community has their own chamchas. Okay? So these sidekicks would come to Amir al-Mu'mineen. He says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, should we fix him? Amir al-Mu'mineen says, is he undermining the stability of the state? Is he calling for the destroying of the stability? of?" He says, no, no, no. He's attacking you on a personal basis. He says, leave him. That's between me and him. Ah, justice. Imagine if someone speaks about us, <laughs> we will dig his seventh forefather up from his grave. You know, his seventh forefather will dig him up from the grave and we will find some fault with him. Not only that, Amir al-Mu'mineen goes beyond that. When the money comes from Khums and Zakat, he says to his Askar, take this share and give it to Al-Ash'ath ibn Qais. This is his right from the Islamic government. Yeah, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he's attacking you. He said, doesn't matter, he's still a Muslim. Munafiq, oh, but he's a Muslim. In front of everyone, he's still what? A Muslim. He's attacking me on a personal note, that's not your problem. That's my problem. We will debate the issue. Don't jump, right? Don't jump the, on the bandwagon. You know, leave it between me and him. If he wants, he can come and face me, we will sort it out, right? I don't need you, right? Take this money and give it to him because it is his haq. Allahu Akbar. And now people want to teach Amir al-Mu'mineen. Why did he do that? Right? Why did he do that? Why did Rasulullah give zakat? You know this? Why did Rasulullah give zakat to Abu Sufyan? Oof. Oh my God. Really? Rasulullah gave zakat to Abu Sufyan? Yes. You know why? To silence him. Because there is a kind of zakat in Islam, one of the expenditure of zakat. You know, we have eight ways of spending zakat. Miskin, yatim, uh, 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 the collector, you know, the one that collects the zakat. He should be paid, not fi sabi business. You know, 
We love this Fisabillah business as Muslims. You know, you just do it for the sake of Allah. Where do I cash this? In which bank? TD Bank? TDD Bank, they call it? TTD or TDD Bank? I don't know. Some sort of a bank. Deutsche Bank? Where do I cash Fisabillah business this? Where? You know, Fisabillah, just come, you know, we have work at the Husayniya. Yeah. What is the cost of the work? Um, just, you know, 20,000 pounds. What do you want me to do? Change all the electricity. Fisabilillah. Really? What? You're going to put um, uh, uh, food on my table, uh, on, on my, uh, 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 you know, children's table? Fisabilillah. Where do I cash it? Anyway. So he comes. One of those expenditure of zakah is for someone called al muallafatu qulubuhum. What does that mean? Mu'allafa qulubuhum. You have enemies. These enemies, the only way to calm them down and not to make them speak ill of you is to give them gifts. You know, not, that's not a bribe. You are establishing what we call what? Uh, 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 an accord. You know? You don't like me. I'm not going to force you to become a Muslim. No way. All right? But you know what? Just please don't say things that are not true at least. Right? Don't go and promote false about us. And he's a gift. You know? Imagine if we did this with some journalist in this country or in other countries. You know? You have the power. Just one article a month, he's the cut money. Just say, at le you know, they call it buffer zone. Creating a buffer zone so that you don't have to do the work. Others will do it for you. Because when others speak about you, it is more effective than defending yourself. Right? He gave it to Abu Sufyan. Ya Ammi, just please, enough. You know? Stop hyping people against us. Stop mobilizing people against us. You know? We've got nothing to do with you. Ya Ammi, we left Mecca for you. Right? We left Mecca, we went to Medina, leave us alone. Right? But we don't engage in what Ahlul Bayt and the Imam Salawatullah wa salamu alayhim has done. The Imam has encouraged us and has instilled enthusiasm in us through these words. We are not negligent. Who are the words belonging to these words I'm reading? I'll stop after this. These are the words of the Imam himself, Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. These are his words. Sallallahu Muhammad wa I'll finish soon. He says, we are not negligent of your affairs and are not forgetful of your remembrance. You know, when we stand up and say, you know, Allahumma kun li waliyyik al -hujjah. He says, we are not forgetful of your remembrance of us. Had it been so, then terrible calamities would have struck you and your enemies would have destroyed you. Be conscious of Allah. Strengthen your hands so that we may relieve you of the tribulation that has afflicted you. The Imam is saying this. When he wrote that letter to who? To a Shaykh al-Mufid. He signed it and he said, tell my followers, I'm not negligent of you. Such love, kindness and affection and fondness is not found even in our own parents, let alone in anyone else. After seeing such kindness and love and compassion... Whose heart will not be moved for the sand that this imam will walk on? Salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. And then he points out why he is not coming. He says, and I will conclude, if our Shias, may Allah give them the grace of obedience, would have fulfilled their covenants with united hearts, then surely there would have been no delay in our meetings and they would have received the blessings of our visitation. But the things which increase the distance between us are such news which we have received about them regarding those actions which we dislike and which we do not expect from them. These are the words of the Imam. It's like he's complaining to us. Why are you doing this? We don't expect you to behave in this way. Allahu Akbar. We want you to be at the best of your behavior. At the best that you do everything in life. Be the best Muslim. Be the best mu'min. But be the best doctor. Be the best engineer. Be the best businessman. Be the best husband. Be the best wife. But be the best Muslim. In everything you do, be the best but also be the best follower of Ahlul Bayt, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. It's my last night with you. I hope that it will not be the last night. 
just for now, inshallah, we can meet again so that we can discuss these teachings of Ahlul Bayt. By the way, brothers, I'm not talking at you. I'm talking with you. Wallah, I'm nothing, not that much higher than you. I am like you and I consider myself below you. Right? Because we need to get that level of interaction with one another where we can freely discuss our affairs so we can elevate our communities. Right? So we can grow together as Muslims. Grow together in the love of Ahlul Bayt. Let us go to Karbala shortly for a small musibah. Tonight we'll speak about Imam Hussein. Imam Zain al Abidin leaves the Kharibah. And while he was leaving, no one realizes that he left Salawatullah to go to Karbala again and bury the dead bodies. After his presence was unfelt, Imam Zain al-Abideen, Sayyidah Zainab began relentlessly looking for him. Asked the woman, the children of the Kharibah, where they left them in that ruin under the scorching sun. No one has seen Ali Zain al-Abideen. Where is my nephew? Where did he go? How come he left us? How is it possible that he's not among us? But Ali Zain al-Abideen has a task. He has to go and identify the bodies in Karbala. He reaches the land of Attaf, the land of Karbon, Wabala. He comes upon Bani Asad. Men and women have gathered to observe these bodies. Though they are in limbs, their limbs have been severed, their bodies have been cut. But there is light that emanates from their bodies and reaches the heaven. In particular, the body of Imam Hussein. They come near him. They say they see that he is stained with his blood, that his chest is leveled with his back. Remember Umar ibn Sa'ad. Remember Umar. When he ordered the horseman to trample over the body of Imam Hussein, ten horsemen came down, changed the hooves of their horses, and began to run over the body of Imam Hussein, Imam Zainul Abidin. Says, I heard noise from my tent. I asked my Amma Zainab, Oh, Amma. Zainab, help me stand on my feet, for I can hear the crushing of glass in my ears. I can't see glass in all of Karbala. Imam Zain al Abidin is led to the tent. It bereaves you, O Mu'mineen, O lovers of Ahlul Bayt, to know what Imam will say shortly when he gazes towards the body of Imam Hussein, he realizes that the crushing of the horses over the body of Imam Hussein is giving the same sound as the crushing of glass. Allahu Akbar. This is Imam Hussein, salawatullah wa salamu He come, they come to the body of Hussein, they see light, they see hymns, they hear hymns, hymns. You know, salawat, takbir, tasbih, coming from the body of Imam Hussein, salawat Allah, salam. They say, what is this body? How come is this body is so graced by the presence of beings that we don't know their nature and they're reciting all this salawat and tasbih on the body? He comes, salawat Allah, salamu alayhi. He asks, ma wukufukum ala hadihi al-ajsad? Why are you standing upon these bodies? He asked Bani Asad. They said, we can't bury them. He says, why you can't bury them? He said, their heads are severed. <laughs> their heads are severed. We cannot identify them. We don't know whose body is who. Imam Zain al-Abideen, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi, goes to the body of his father, Imam Hussein, 
a grave has already been dug. He says, O oh people, do you have some shrouds to cover the body of my body? They said, no, we don't. They say, but why are you asking? He says, every time I try to carry the body from one end, the other end falls apart. I can't contain the body of my father in one go to bring him down into his grave. Then he asked from sort of a carpet, do you have a carpet made of hasir or straw? They said, yes, this we can provide. He brings that, they bring that hasir, they bring that kind of carpet or straw carpet. He places it under the body of his father Hussein. He carries the body, brings it down into the grave while he's laying the body of Imam Hussein. You know, brothers and sisters, it is recommended that you turn the body towards Qibla. When Imam Zain al Abidin began to carry or change the body to the right side to first the Qibla, the body of Imam Hussein began to fall apart so he turned the whole straw carpet towards the Qibla then he laid his father then he came to put you know some sort of sand make it into a pillow then he realized there was no head Allahu Akbar how do you rest the head of Imam Hussein on a pillow of sand when the head is severed when he fixes the body in place he tries to come out of the grave his back is bent he calls out to Bani Asad Aina al-Radi Allahu Akbar where is Ali al-Azghar where is Abdullah al -Radhi? Listen to these brothers and sisters. Tonight your heart will be broken on Imam Hussein salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. Bani Asad said, Ya Imam, oh man, they didn't recognize him initially. Oh man, why are you calling for Abdullah al -Radhi? He says, we will build a grave separate to him. That baby that is thrown on the plains of Karbala, that six old month baby, it is not difficult to dig a grave for him. He says, no, no, it was at the behest of my father, Hussein. <laughs> When I was about to leave the grave, I heard his nahar, you know, his neck. Imam Hussein was speaking from his neck where his head was severed. He's saying, oh, my son Ali, bring my radhi. Put him on my chest. Bury him in the same grave as me. That's why when we go to the ziyara, we do that of Imam Hussein first and then we remember Abdullah al-Radhi because he's buried together with his father Ali Hussein ibn Ali then he says bring my brother Ali al-Akbar to bury him next to my father he does then he buries the Ashab then he buries the children look what happens now Bani Asad say to him have you finished there is no more bodies on the plains of Karbala. All has been buried. They all have been gone. You know, Imam Zayl Abidin, he says, no, no, no. We Ahlul Bayt have one more body. I said, which body? He said, the body of the seven hands. The body of Abbas brother of Hussein because he was not near the battlefield he was closer to the water he says let's go and bring his body Allahu Akbar look what happens when the Imam is going towards the body of Abu Fadl al Abbas he remembers that there was something missing from the body of his father Imam Hussein so he goes back to the grave he looks for something he bends he finds that something he begins to kiss it. Benny Asad say, what is this thing that you've just picked up? He says, this is the finger of my father. Imam Hussein, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. Then he goes a little more steps and he looks for an arrow, for a particular arrow. He finds the arrow. They said, okay, you've collected his limbs, but why the arrow? 
He said, this is the arrow that penetrated his heart. Piece of his heart was still stuck to that arrow. Allahu Akbar, he removes the piece of heart from the arrow and places it back into the body of Imam Hussein. Then he goes, he buries Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Then he goes back to the Kharibah. Zainab comes to Imam Zain al-Abidin. She says, oh nephew, where were you? He says, I went to bury your brother Hussein. She says, says, why didn't you take me with you? He says, you've already died once. You don't want to die another time. You've already saw the death of your brother Hussein, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh. You want to die another time and witness his burial. She says to him, tell me one thing. When you put my brother in his grave, how did you put his head under the sand? He says, my aunt, there was no head. There is no head. I buried him without a head along all the companions and Ahlul Bayt. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Wa sayya'lamu alladheena zalamu ala Muhammadin ayyamun qalabin yanqalibun. La hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. Brothers and sisters, we have so many people who have asked us to pray for them. This being, you know, the 15th night of, you know, Safar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, will respond to your prayers, to your sincere hearts. To this night where Ahlul Bayt, salamullah alayhim, are observing these tears. And inshallah, these tears will not go to waste with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the bottom of your heart, with the sincerity of your intentions, turn towards Allah and let us pray five times. You know, dua al marid amman yujib al muttar. For those who have asked us and for those who don't have anyone to pray for them. Pray for them from the bottom of your heart, with the sincerity of your intention, with the clarity of your nafs. Five times from the bottom of your hearts. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim with the loudest of your voice. Amman Yujibul Muttarra Ida Daa Wa Yakshifusu Amman Muttarra Ida Daa Wa Yakshifusu Amman أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه. Last time. أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء بحق محمد وآل محمد by the right of Muhammad and his family and by the right of سورة المباركة الفاتحة proceeded with صلوات على محمد وآل محمد. Just in the end, brothers, this is two minutes of your time. I'm sorry I took much of your time. I know it's a Monday night. But as I said, it's the last night of my gathering with you or my time with you. Uh, just as a matter of courtesy, I would like to extend my sincere thanks and gratitude to all the previous committees and the present committee for availing me of the opportunity always to be among you at this particular center. May Allah reward you all for all your efforts and for all that you are doing for this community. May Allah give you the tasdeed, the tawfiq, all the success in serving the community. Whichever committee comes, may Allah give them the tawfiq with the sincerity to serve this community to the best of their ability and to the best that they can for the love of Allah, the Prophet, and Ahlul Bayt, salawat Allah, salamu alayhi. On another note, I would also like to ask for your pardon and apology. If in any way or any case, God forbid, I have offended anyone, which is not my intention. I've yelled more than I should. I raised my voice more than I should. Forgive this humble servant of yours in all honesty. It is out of love and concern for us all that sometimes I get excited. Huh? Sometimes, you know, I, I shout. But it is not intended at any one of you. I'm not mentioning these, you know, things that I mention in my culture, in my lecture, in order to point, pinpoint at someone, God forbid, or at an event or at a situation. We're mentioning this in order that we can all grow together and perfect our 
selves just like Ahlul Bayt expect of us. I expect your pardon and forgiveness. And from my end, may Allah bless you all. Wa jazakumullah khair. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi tayyibin al tahirin. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein.
پردے میں تھی اور میں بے پردہ کری ہوں اے شام کے لوگوں میں بنتے علی ہوں اے شام کے لوگوں میں بنتے زنجیروں میں جکرا جو یہ مار کھڑا ہے سجدہ اس کعبے کی فسی لو نے کیا ہے منصب میں برا وہ ہے میں ریشتے میں بری ہوں اے شام کے لوگوں میں بنتے علی ہوں اے شام کے لوگوں میں بنتے علی ہوں ہونے لگی دربار میں موش تر کا زانے ریحان ادھر نام نبی گونجا فضا میں بی بی نے کہا فخر سے میں جیت گئی ہوں اے شام کے لوگوں میں بنتے علی ہوں اے شام کے لوگوں میں بنتے علی ہوں میں وارث تطہیر ہوں ناموں سے نبی ہوں اے شام کے لوگوں میں بنتے علی ہوں اے شام کے لوگوں میں بنتے علی ہوں میں بنتے علی ہوں یا حسین یا حسین یا حسین بر محمد و آل محمد صلوات Brothers and sisters, we've uh, got a couple of uh, announcements. Um, we've been requested to recite Dua Shafa for a four-month-old baby uh, who's in hospital. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. أما يجيب المفتر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Tomorrow at 2.30 there is a, uh, a mayat uh, over here which will be, um, oh, at 2.30 over here there will be a mayat um, and we'll be reciting uh, Salat al-Mayat over here. Preceding that we'll be going to the Janatul Firdaus Rawan Road, Kabristan. Uh, also just uh, on a, another note, just before everyone's leaving or when everyone is leaving, if you could be as quiet as possible, there is uh, Ghusl al-Mayat being conducted. Uh, so if you can bear that in mind as well. Lastly, um, as you've all heard, uh, it is Sheikh Jihad's last night tonight, uh, on, and on behalf of the committee, on behalf of all the, the members here, and uh, for everyone attending Haydri over the last couple of nights, Sheikh, we thank you from the, the bottom of our hearts for the inspiring and uh, enlightening lectures that you've given us, and as a token of our appreciation, our collective appreciation, if we can all recite three loud salawats for Sheikh. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم توجه زيارة السلام عليك يا نبي الله السلام عليك يا حبيب الله السلام عليك يا رسول الله السلام عليك يا أمير المؤمنين سيد الوصيين إمام المتقين 
السلام عليك يا فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين السلام عليك يا خديجة الكبرى أم المؤمنين السلام عليك يا حسن المجتبى السلام عليك يا عبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني جميعا سلام الله عبدا ما بقيت وبكي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي ابن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين السلام عليك يا شهداء كربلاء جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا غريب الغرب السلام عليك يا معين الضعفاء والفقراء السلطان بن حسن مولانا علي بن موسى الرضا كن شفيعنا وشفيع والدينا في يوم الجزاء السلام عليك وعلى أختك فاطمة المعصومة ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا مولانا يا صاحب الأسي والزمان السلام عليك يا خليفة الرحمن السلام عليك يا شريك القرآن الأمان 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 الفتنة الزمان عجل الله تعالى فرجك وصح الله مخرجك وظهورك وجعلنا من أنصارك وشعتك ومحبك السلام عليك وعلى آبائك الطاهرين ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل الساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرزك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد